Hello, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to the BD Virtual Customer Series, December 2020. All together now, driving patient-centered care through connectivity. The first event of these particular series, um, BD is sponsoring on your behalf exclusively as BD customers for all disciplines and leadership levels. Today's program will focus on diversion, uncovering the unseen, revealing actionable approaches to diversion management. A quick note, our next series will be in February of 2021. Today, I'm particularly uh, uh, happy to be bringing this first series, a rapidly evolving healthcare landscape and the impact on drug diversion. In this particular next uh, few minutes, we'll review the latest news, trends, regulations, and policies surrounding drug diversion. I'm Perry Flowers, and I'm delighted to serve as your MC for today. Specifically, a little bit about me, uh, bringing over 29 years of healthcare experience in both for-profit and not-for-profit systems. I've been uh, focused on clinical care, uh, pharmacy management, and some consulting uh, for hospitals and healthcare systems and during that time. I published on topics related to pharmacy administration, operational strategy, logistics, and supply chain. I serve BD as Vice President for Medical Affairs, Enterprise Medication Management. I'm responsible for the strategic positioning and medical and clinical affairs related to the medication management process, patient safety, and the medication use systems within enterprise uh, health systems in the U.S. and around the world. Prior to joining BD, I held positions with uh, Kaiser Permanente and also with Memorial Hermann Health System in Houston. I have the high honor to introduce our co-presenter for this uh, session, Jessica Johnson. Jess leads the external affairs and public policy engagement for BD's uh, largest business segment. Having worked previously for Covidian and Boston Scientific, Jess draws on her extensive experience in the medical technology industry to develop and implement legislative and regulatory strategies which serve to advance business and customer priorities at both national and local levels. Prior to her career in the medical technology space, Jess worked for the Juvenile Diabetes Research Foundation grassroots advocacy arm in Washington, where she managed mobilization efforts in support of federal funding for diabetes research. Before her stint in the healthcare nonprofit sector, she worked for two DC-based public affairs, communications, and lobbying firms. In these roles, she drove state and federal legislative, regulatory, and procurement efforts on behalf of clients representing the various sectors of business. Jess graduated from Georgetown University with a bachelor's degree in English and psychology. Welcome, Jess. Thank you so much for that warm introduction. So as we think about this uh, agenda for today um, in the area of um, the rapidly evolving healthcare landscape, there are several items that we'll cover in today's session. We look at the, a macro view today of pandemic um, policies and how it's Im impacting our healthcare systems and our infrastructure, looking at those risks. Also the current state of diversion. And we would welcome your uh, questions throughout um, as we'll have some time at the end for some discussion. Without further um, commentary on my behalf, Jess, Thank you for being here today. We we'll look forward to your comments. Thanks again for that warm introduction, Perry, and thanks to all of you for taking time out of your busy schedules today to talk about what I believe is an incredibly important topic, that of the healthcare landscape. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to talk through what I see as the healthcare policy value chain, um, but also what has evolved um, before us in defining what the healthcare policy landscape is today. I think it's important to often take a look back before we take a look at what we're dealing with today. 
I also am going to steer clear of election politics, but I do anticipate dissecting carefully some of those pandemic politics at play that are truly driving attention and sharpening the pencil around an issue like drug diversion in the healthcare space. You know, before I before we step into the macro and micro views of the current landscape and the evolution of that landscape, I wanted to take a brief moment to talk through some of the basics in terms of how I see healthcare policy truly drive uh, change. And I think a common misconception is that uh, you know legislation and administrative mandates really push change, and that's absolutely not the case. I'm putting forward here, uh, you know, a visual that is an everyday example of what I go through as a mom today. I'm a public policy professional second, and I often think about first thing in the morning, how I'm going to get dinner on the table with truly a tough audience at, at the end of it. Often the hardest part for me is actually identification of what we're actually going to eat and also all the things that need to take place and the compromise that needs to happen and the support that's needed in order to really get dinner on the table and of course um, my customer my customer my children and my family are sometimes a tough crowd to to um, to work with you know i can tell you that with the pandemics at play you know land the landscape that drives this value chain is truly what um, involves a you know a healthy policy making environment and so i wanted this to be the central point for all of the items that I'll be discussing today. You know, I walked you through this everyday value chain because it's hard to dissect the healthcare policy landscape today without really understanding what truly drives real world need. And many of these topics I think that you see here are, are familiar ones, but I think the important nuance is that public health transparency, for example, you can't talk about that topic without centering in on digital health and data sharing. And then, and then of course, as you layer in things like privacy and intellectual property, all of these things make a difference. You know, one, one impacts the other. And so, you know, I think a lot of the, the general public and awareness around a topic like drug diversion, it isn't one of the same. You have to look at it um, as a part of an entire ecosystem. And when I think about pricing pressures and the, the increasing attention on patient outcomes and what that truly means from a community perspective, um, this is why healthcare safety is really becoming an important topic well before the COVID-19 landscape. And then of course, fast forward to, to 2020 and everything that has ensued over the past six months, the, the attention like never before on shortages of critical medical technology, and diversions of medications, sometimes medications that are that are being defined as controlled substances that aren't even controlled substances are at an all time high. I think another interesting piece of this, and we're on the brink of it right now, is going to be around vaccine deployment and how how diversion of new therapies and, and therapies that we cannot waste um, will play out. And so much much to look forward to and, and to see what plays out here in 2021 as well. But before talking about the future of the landscape, I wanted to take a step back and look at some of the chain of, of events and, and the chain reaction here in terms of what has played out and how it's impacted topics such as drug diversion. You know, a lot of people throw around the, the enactment of the Drug Supply Chain Security Act as, as the most important piece of legislation that's driven attention on drug diversion, but I don't believe that that's the only reason why there's been a finer point on the topic. I think this is ultimately where the stage was set, but it really it incented a complete chain reaction on things like traceability and transparency. And from my standpoint, you know, data sharing, when you get back to, to when we go back to the, the future of healthcare and, and what data sharing looks like. This legislation really set into motion a, a finer point on, on that piece of it in a way that I don't think that the community and the general public really understood, let alone healthcare organizations. Fast forward to 2015, when things started to really get moving on the Drug Supply Chain Security Act implementation, and this is right about the time when prescribing became an all-time high for 
controlled substances. And then in 2017, you see Health and Human Services declare a true public health emergency around a very, very important topic that still exists today. Meanwhile, we see healthcare organizations be incented to embrace EHR. And of course, interoperability is at an all time high along the lines of that transparency storyline. And certainly in 2020, with the pandemic, the story continues. And what I really think is interesting about the healthcare policy landscape today with the pandemic is that there's never been more of a general awareness about how important supply chain is, security is, and the attention on the healthcare worker. I also think it's important to look at the, the care delivery campaigns that have come before us in the form of a great example around the American Nurses Association's efforts to launch Healthy Nurse Healthy Nation about three years ago. They were really on to something in terms of truly making the connection between the healthcare worker and the nurse in this case and the well being of a patient um, and the outcomes of, of patient care. I think, you know, medication safety and transparency around supply chain was at an all time high here, but these campaigns have been around well before the pandemic and are truly, truly playing out in a way that, again, the general public is much more aware of. I think the interesting part about the Center for Disease Control and what they launched in 2009 around the one and only campaign is that they actually identified drug diversion as a topic well before drug supply chain security was enacted and other implementations. Um, but again, these issues have all been around for quite some time, that connection between the healthcare worker and patient safety and has, has you know, really evolved quite a lot over the past several years. But again, there's always been that under thread that I think is really important to understand when, when we look at the context of drug diversion today. I also think it's important to talk about the definition of patient safety, which I think um, different audiences view differently. Um, to me, one of, one of my favorite definitions because of the simplicity of it, it is the prevention of harm to patients put forward many years ago from the Institute of Medication Management um, at the time, that was their name. And you know the emphasis that, again, they, they put on the connection between healthcare workers and prevention of errors and the the learning from those errors i think is really important to dissect when you talk about medication management and safety in the context of drug diversion and i think to even put a more fine point on the topic medication management is starting to really emerge as either one component or of safety or the most component but most important component of safety and i think that that awareness is now a a real time uh, reality. In 2019, I think we saw the awareness of drug diversion really emerge as not just a problem, but something that actually has to be dealt with. And I think what's what's really interesting about members of Congress coming together with stakeholders is that this really became a discussion topic. It wasn't necessarily something that had been fully studied or understood, but there was acknowledgement that this issue in some ways had to be destigmatized in order to find meaningful solutions. And of course, while policy didn't emerge from a legislative perspective um, at the time, I do think that there was interest to really st start to look at studies, start to look at the topic from different angles, even outside the healthcare space. And when I, when I think about drug diversion in 2020, even before even thinking about the pandemic and all that's transparenting around that topic and how that relates to drug diversion, I think it's important to first state that diversion is something that's not just something that policymakers are actually thinking about. This is something that the general public, again, is, is increasing their awareness on and their interest in. And when it when a topic becomes one that's a subject of the community, <clears throat> I think that it makes it even more important from a healthcare perspective. Because in my opinion, all politics is local and all healthcare organizations have to localize the needs of their communities. And so that intersection is really, really important in terms of uh, looking at a topic, but more importantly, identifying solutions. And when I think about the three buckets listed here, two of these are actually 
not just healthcare related. Um, I think they're putting a finer point on the healthcare policy landscape, but you're starting to see this emerge as a broader healthcare um, topic that really transcends the healthcare policy space. When you see organizations like the Office of Inspector General and the VA start to study issues like drug diversion, I think that's a, a interesting way of putting forward an issue even beyond the healthcare landscape. And of course, you know, there's definitely an uptick in attorneys general, generals looking at looking at this topic and enforcing the topic. And then also the DEA is looming around and and doing what they need to get after this issue as well. We're gonna get into the public health piece of this around the COVID-19 pandemic, um, but I also wanted to touch on payment because I think payment in essence really drives the healthcare policy landscape. Um, I know that this is something that frustrates people, including myself all the time, but it's, it's really the factor that drives almost every piece of legislation there is um, in addition to the need. And so when you see the tightening of Medicare and Medicaid policies transcend and the, the issues around costs and unaccounted medications and, and supplies in the medical technology space, again, these are putting finer points and new optics around drug diversion that have never been there before. And when I think about 2020 and all that has um, consumed us for the past six months as a nation and a community. I have never seen in my 15 years in politics and healthcare policy more collaboration and more cutting of red tape than in the last six months. And of course, all of it centers around rapidly addressing healthcare infrastructure needs. Um, there's been some terrific programs that have emerged, hospitals without walls that I heard actually this week that they're, they may actually be even making permanent. And of course, CMS is um, continually putting out waivers to provide flex flexibility. I think the interesting point, of, point here is that with all of this comes new risk factors that we need to, to deal with as a nation and a community in a healthcare landscape. Contact tracing and tracking of patient outcomes is also incredibly essential. And I think, you know, to put an even finer point on this, on this topic, you know, to me, I think contact tracing and tracking of outcomes in the healthcare system has always been something that people believe we need, but they've never needed to do it and, until now in a way that the pandemic has put you know, sharpen that pencil around. And of course, collaboration is at an all time high. And then just to put an even finer point on the COVID-19 landscape, never has healthcare worker safety and well-being been as important as it is today. And of course, there, there's a tremendous amount of risk awareness out there for this particular topic. And I think one of the points I want to make here, because I think we've touched on many of the three items listed here, is that there's always been a general awareness on care extending beyond the acute care settings and the beyond the walls of the hospital, so to speak. There's always been a need to discuss pandemic preparedness. And I think there has been a genuine understanding of clinician burnout, but again, there has never been that connection with the, the general public that there is today. And I think, you know, again, when we think about being on the brink of vaccine deployment and all that's going to transpire um, starting this month in December and then heading into the, the new year in 2021, it's really going to be interesting to see how drug diversion plays a, a much greater role as part of the solution, not just an emerging issue that the healthcare system needs to deal with. So to summarize, um, again, really appreciate the opportunity to share some insights, but I wanted to offer up this as a new stage from what transpired back in 2013 with the Drug Supply Chain and Security Act. I think this trifecta to me is really something that we all need to, to take a look at in terms of strong implications for drug diversion. And with that, I am going to pass the baton back to my colleague, Perry. Thank you, Jess. I uh, certainly enjoyed those uh, comments on the policy. Your insightfulness is uh, uh, very significant. I'm glad to have you as part of the program. 
We're making the transition now over to the medical and the clinical side, um, making that uh, commentary on 2020, a, a year like no other. I think we could have come up with uh, any number of different uh, titles, uh, but, but I thought that uh, even as Jess's comments that uh, um, collaboration and uh, partnership um, in public policy, uh, very significant, as she mentioned over the last six months. I've seen that across uh, organizations where um, it, uh, if there was a need down the street, um, everybody was reaching out to expand um, uh, clinical staff, um, um, looking at uh, licensure waivers, and so that a uh, year like no other. But I would certainly recognize, and it's certainly not uh, uh, for those uh, customers on the call today. The patient care burden of acuity and volume are tremendous. Um, even as a new and novel disease is approaching us in the different types of care, it, uh, it should not go without stating that the burden of that um, is tremendous on our organizations, uh, financially certainly, uh, but on our staff as even as Jeff just mentioned. And if we look at the literature around the diversion, and we look at the, the mental health piece that has always played that, whether it's general population or even clinicians, and that, uh, that mental health has uh, been and continues to be a, a driving force in, in the way that uh, clinicians trigger into the possibility of diversion. And looking at that compassion fatigue and even battle stress, it's only, certainly been reported that our, our clinicians that are that they're the only person that the patient is coming in contact with with some of the COVID protocols and the just the enormity of that compassion over those shifts and multiple days in a row um, is significant and the battle stress of um, the the mass unit uh, the field hospital the expanded into a lobby or a convention center those where those moments have been reported and documented to be wearing on our, our clinical colleagues. And the pressure points are uh, not to be mistaken. Um, yes, there were several um, acts of uh, reimbursement and checks and all that coming from the government, but the financial burden that's placed on um, uh, essential workers or their families, and really the, the bipolarness of going in solitude from one uh, area or across his care of the other. I, I have a intensivist uh, colleague who is living out of their garage, um, crisis care, and then home in the garage to make sure that he's not uh, sharing anything with his family. And in that solitude, it, it's really that uh, pressure point of adjustment for both. And it's certainly not acute care problem. Uh, recently documented several events in skilled nursing facilities but if we all would recognize that in those SNFs, the pressure of uh, the patient acuity and the compassion fatigue are as present in a SNF unit as they are in our acute care systems. On a national level, I think the Jess uh, touched on just a little bit around the burden and risk in a patient care. And um, even uh, the second victim uh, scenarios where uh, you're taking care of a patient who's not actually getting their medications, and that's that's a, a burden on that second caregiver. But the patient, if the patient is the center, as the patient is the center of our engagement, and um, if a diversion is taking place, then then the, they are taking it either from the patient um, with reduced or even omitted any medications. Uh, they could that uh, individual could be refilling vials or syringes. Um, that uh, wasn't done under aseptic preparation. And so we've, the literature is uh, uh, several publications related to exposure to infectious material to the patient. And then finally, at the, at, at the, at the very focus of patient care, the medical record uh, needs to be accurate uh, relating to the actual care. Um, and so when you look over time or you look at the, um, uh, the, the, the what actually took place to the patient, and if that's uh, error, if that medical record is wrong, um, 
then those are patient care problems. At a, at a, at a local or state or national level in the repository of cases, uh, there is certainly a call in around the uh, clinical community that we need that. Um, how the diversions are occurring, um, by what methods and models, and having a repository of cases. There are a couple of groups that have started, um, certainly voluntary to submit those. Um, there, are, there are those repository or registries, um, and we would certainly agree that uh, there's a need for that. We need to learn from those repository of cases so then uh, our own practices could be adjusted, technology um, adjusted uh, for those new ways of, for diversion. And it certainly it goes without with the US model that the boards uh, that oversee our clinical team have varied levels of rules and regs. And uh, very specifically how each of those states deal with substance abuse and treatment and monitoring programs for um, nurses, uh, pharmacists, and, and physicians. And even in the same state, those boards may actually handle differently around whether they're um, open for curative programs or more punitive. And looking at the pandemic impact, I mean, it wouldn't be 2020 if we didn't look at the impact. And, and I would offer that um, with our own technology and monitoring surveillance systems that uh, you have active in your, in your health systems, um, during the pandemic, we certainly have competing priorities of time or personnel or assignment or um, uh, the, the focus on uh, diversion isn't the key. Certainly our patient care and acuity burdens uh, maybe drive some of that. I mentioned uh, the field hospitals or expanded locations or a nearby um, offsite uh, convention center, if you will. And, and those are additional um, noise levels or signals coming in that weren't there before. No run rate, no trend, no uh, no chance for analysis, and those noise levels would certainly um, change the way you handle your own monitoring at your organization. I noticed this uh, a quote from uh, one of our ISMP colleagues, Christina, and, and this also, um, her conclusion of no news is not good news, certainly matches the BD-sponsored research from 2019 where there was a, a recognition of hospital administrators and uh, clinical directors that certainly acknowledged that diversion is real, um, but four fifths of the respondents in that particular survey said that diversion was not a problem at their facility. I found uh, a, Mark's a quote, and re recently he uh, published that the consequence of increased pressures and occupational stress is at greater risk that healthcare workers will abuse drugs as coping mechanism. So if we bundle in the mental health piece, the stress piece, um, maybe some of the other influencing uh, financial pressures or the like, or self-medicating, certainly Mark's quote is very applicable. And a key observation piece around your fellow staff members, um, see something, say something. We've all heard that. But staff training has shown to be um, essential in a in a diversion prevention program, um, raising awareness for them, uh, empowering them in a speak up uh, culture, have shown to be very uh, successful. And if your organization um, hasn't done that, I would certainly have you think about adding uh, staff training to your uh, onboarding, or at least uh, maybe in your annual competencies reviews. There are technology advances. Uh, certainly, this is. Um, an area over the last several years where key technologies around augmented intelligence and, and other capabilities around analytics to create those closed loop methodologies um, have greatly ad assisted in identifying quicker those diversion risks. And I would have you uh, think about for, um, that diversion is not only about controlled substances. Uh, mentioned that uh, in a pandemic and so scarce items, protective uh, equipment, PPE. Uh, there have been uh, cases reported, not a lot, but some cases around 
where uh, masks and face coverings and PPE are in such short supply um, that uh, diversion is, and organizations have put the PPP under lock and key, if you will. And even high cost medications um, um, or um, opportunities for diversion, the controls programs that uh, we would have in place looking at uh, protecting uh, a value of patient care, but that's also high cost or in high demand. Uh, would certainly have you think about that as organizations look at um, the particular diversion prevention programs that uh, you've deployed. So on behalf of Jess and myself and all of our BD associates, thank you very much for attending uh, today's session. And the, let's see. There is a polling box um, just below the video screen. And if you would um, uh, be able to submit your questions through that uh, polling box, uh, we have a few moments to address those. We thank you for your questions in advance. Jess, I do have a question for you while uh, our attendees are, are typing in their questions. As you look at uh, the CMS payments, and you mentioned that uh, during your prepared remarks. Um, it, it does seem like that with a CMS payment model, that that's a validation. And that's my word, and that's not, that's not yours, but it's a validation of the seriousness uh, uh, that CMS is identified for patient care and for employee safety. Uh, is, is that how you've um, interpreted the, the CMS moves? Absolutely, and I think there's payment structures and incentives but the agency also um, with a lot of the pandemic waivers have have really you know lowered the bar to to support the pandemic but in doing so have created a tremendous amount of um, risk factors for for again healthcare institutions and, and the community to engage on so i think um, it's a really great question perry and i think in answering it i think it's more than just payment but that is the starting point they are incentivizing um, you know, cost, uh, efficiency, and of course, patient outcomes are at an all-time high, and visibility around patient outcomes is at an all-time all high. But I think in looking, looking at the organization more holistically, that combined with what they're doing around the pandemic is really creating, um, you know, a center stage for solutions around drug diversion, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I would agree. Um, Jess, the next uh, question I had for you from uh, between our two um, slide decks, one was the area of the state variances. I mentioned in my comments the variation around um, uh, uh, assistance programs. Um, and I think that I've heard you uh, talk about the movement to um, really shine a light on those uh, programs to more create standards around uh, clinician and recovery programs at a national level. And I just didn't know if you had uh, any additional comments about that, that effort. Well, I think, you know, I think the federal government does its best to, to push through overarching legislative initiatives um, and as well as administrative actions. But to my point earlier in my presentation, all politics is local and healthcare is localized as well. And so the solutions, um, you know, in my opinion, are not a one size fits all, fits all approach. And I think many of you online here today would really appreciate that. And so to me, I think what's really happened with the, the pandemic and, and the collaboration that's ensued is more of a partnership between um, what the federal government sees as a priority but also what that looks like locally. And I'm not suggesting that we should have 50 state, uh, states worth of solutions and there actually are 64 jurisdictions throughout the country but rather are there a few that really work and that, that can be tailored at, at the local level? And I think you're gonna see this play out um, around an issue like drug diversion as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Jess. So just as a reminder, the, the link below your screen uh, contains a, um, a polling box or a Q&A form, if you will. And that's the method to submit questions in uh, for Jess or myself.
and I see that uh, the questions are coming in. But Jess, I have one more uh, for you before we, uh, as the, the our attendees are putting in some questions on their own. When we look at uh, the um, the model of um, the policy and your grid um, that you showed from idea to idea spe uh, specificity, um, can you envision um, a couple of ideas that have uh, been generated that uh, maybe are behind the scenes that the uh, our, um, our BD uh, customers would like to know about some ideas that maybe not have made the press or could have been hidden with all the noise with uh, the pandemic? Well, I think, you know, to me, you know, I think the awareness is there. I think, I hope my presentation um, sufficiently, sufficiently show that. I think what needs to happen next is that, that collaboration. So if you think about the value chain and opening up a can, I think the pandemic has opened up that can of soup. Getting that to the dinner table is is probably the hardest part in, ter in terms of next steps. And I think that's gonna take a great deal of funding. I think that there are several ideas and solutions on the table that both healthcare institutions, stakeholders and policymakers are on board with. Um, but I think the funding needs to be there in order to support the infrastructure. Um, and I also think that there needs to be a better understanding of that, that end customer. In the case of my value chain, it's my kids and my family, but um, ultimately, what is what works for healthcare institutions? What's that real world need that needs to be addressed? And of course, um, you know, in order for good policy form formulation to really play out effectively in terms of implementation, yeah. you need to understand the end goal and and what the need is of that of, the, of a given community. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jess. And I um, I think one of our um, attendees was really thinking about that next step and. And their question goes, well, when we get back to normal, and I thought it was interesting, they put it in quotes, back to normal. Um, when, so when the pandemic crisis uh, subsides and legislators uh, go back to normal, what are some legislative actions that uh, very well may be a priority related to the opioid crisis and or diversion? So I think you're starting to actually see this um, play out right before our eyes. But again, getting back to that transparency piece, um, yeah. never in a way before has transparency and data sharing been more important. But with that comes more visibility on topics such as drug diversion. So I think there's going to be a tremendous amount of data that comes out of the pandemic and out of the pandemic response, uh, particularly with particularly around some of those new healthcare infrastructure needs. Um, and I think what's interesting is, you know, the, the healthcare policy community needs to take a look at the data and what they found, similar to what the OIG um, was studying and the VA to their specific audiences, but on a much broader scale. How does the data and the science translate into the solution? And I think what we're going to find, and again, this is just a hunch, but that there, it's not, it's not just about identification of the problem, but the data. Uh, my hope is that we'll really solve for, for the meaningful solution at, at the end of the day and what makes sense in terms of how much funding, how what ingredients really need to go into that um, policy adoption and, and formulation. Uh, Jess, it's very interesting you uh, mentioned the data. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, BD is uh, looking at our data analytics. I'm sure our uh, customers have uh, analytics on their uh, top of their list as well. And so the the, the waivers that you mentioned and some of the allowances made by uh, state uh, uh, regular regulations and all, and looking at where the where care went, will be very important um, as we look at this uh, year in review. Very and good. And I think to answer the question on new the new normal, um, you know, I, I don't see a return to normalcy anytime soon, and so. I think it's important to put that out there. I think people are going to view healthcare in a much different way. They have already over the past six months. Um, so the new normal essentially will be a much greater awareness on how the healthcare policy landscape impacts individuals. So again, when you think about public policy, which is a word that is thrown, thrown around, I think more often than not, it really should truly be about the public. And in some ways, that's one of the most positive things that has actually come out of the novel coronavirus response. Yeah, I would agree. 
So I'm looking at the uh, Q&A board. Um, no more questions from our group. Uh, again, let me, on behalf of uh, BD, all of our associates, Jess and myself, thank you everyone for attending this particular uh, session. I would remind you that the next session will stop at uh, start at the uh, top of the hour. Um, and if you'll um, please close your browser window to, as we conclude this event, and then uh, reinitiate uh, just before the top of the hour for our second session. And again, uh, thank you, Jess, for all of your comments today and your expertise. And with that, thank you so we'll, much. You bet. And with that, we'll uh, conclude this particular session.